Well, welcome everyone. I am uh, Muska Olhak and I'm the Director of Programming at Social Innovation Canada. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our investment readiness uh, webinar. Uh, we will start the event shortly, but before we begin, I would like to do a land acknowledgement. Uh, today, we as a community are gathering in a digital realm for many individual spaces. Together, we would like to acknowledge that the land on which we operate is located on the traditional territory of the Huron Vendette, the Haudenosaunee, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations. Today, we are excited to highlight Nectar's investment ready journey uh, from challenges to opportunities, how they overcame barriers to access investment. You will also hear perspectives from the investors uh, who were part of their, of their journey, as well as some practical takeaways and key lessons learned throughout this process. This webinar is part of our investment readiness programming in partnership with Employment and Social Development Canada, ESDC. Uh, the goal of the program is to grow and strengthen the social innovation and social finance ecosystem by providing information, opportunities, resources, and connections that will help uh, social purpose organizations become investment ready. In terms of the uh, overall flow of this event, uh, we will start with a brief presentation by Mark andre and Owen. Uh, following the presentation, there will be an engaging panel discussion with some important insights and perspectives from the rest of the speakers. There will be an audience Q&A segment at the end of the panel, so please add your question in a chat box throughout the session. Uh, just some additional uh, very quick housekeeping notes. We have live French language closed captioning available, so for those of you looking to have that option visible on your end, you can select the show captions on your screen and uh, click the up caret button to select translate to, and from there you can choose your desired language from the drop down menu. Um, as a reminder, this session is being recorded, and if you experience any technical difficulties, please reach out to my uh, colleagues, Palak and Alex in the chat, uh, and they'll be able to assist you right away. We also have a very uh, short poll for you, which will launch right now. Uh, this is uh, to help with the panel discussions later. So please kindly take a few uh, seconds to complete these two polling questions for us. Uh, and now, without further ado, I would like to invite and introduce Marc-Andre and Owen. Uh, Marc-Andre Roberge is the co-founder and CEO of Nectar Technologies, a company on a mission to help the beekeeping industry raise thriving honeybee colonies to secure our food supply. With a background in product design and Google's 30 Weeks alumni, Mark andre developed a passion for beekeeping while working on designs to better human bees interactions. Owen Cullen is the executive director of Upper Canada Equity Fund. Uh, Owen is responsible for executive leadership and management of the fund and works closely with investment partners and stakeholders to achieve the fund's objectives. Owen was also a member of the Board of Trustees of the Healthcare of Ontario Pension Plan and served uh, on the Investment Committee of the $70 billion fund. Owen uh, was also the Economics Correspondent for the Financial Times in Washington, D.C., and also appeared as, as a guest analyst on BBC, CBC, NBC, uh, as well as uh, CNBC and Fox News. Thank you, Mark Andre and Owen, for joining us. And now uh, over to you to get us started with the presentation. Awesome. Thank you, Muska. Um, thank you for having me today. I'm super thrilled to have the chance to share a bit more about our journey and, and possibly uh, provide some insights to uh, other founders and maybe investors during the Q&A afterwards. So um, I'm going to give you a better overview of what, of what Nectar does. Um, and kind of our, our path to get to where we're at today. And obviously it's, it's still just the beginning, but um, um, so here on the slides, you see an almond orchard, right? So um, as some of you may know, about a third of the food that we grow depends on honeybee pollination. So here you've got a traditional beekeeper with colonies uh, placed in the orchard. Um, and oh, oh, and if you go to the next slide, um, there are multiple crops that fully depend on the health of bees. So I just mentioned almonds, but here you've got blueberry flowers and crops like cranberries, apples, lots of hybrid seeds um, fully depend on 
um, bees coming in the field brought by beekeepers and then the bees goes around during flowering uh, or like blossom and um, they're going to pollinate and then the bees are taken to a next location by the beekeepers to keep on pollinating. So here you've got like the, the, the ways that this is done, right? So like we're talking about industrial scale agriculture. So beekeepers literally moving beehives from one location to another on trucks. So in the States, for example, like the typical uh, cycle, you would have a beekeeper from uh, Texas moving bees to California in February, then moving them to Washington state to do cherries afterwards, um, and then produce honey in North Dakota, and then go back to for, for wintering in Texas. Um, next slide. So um, the current ways of managing a honeybee operation pretty much looks like this, whether you're managing a thousand hives or, or 50,000 hives, you're gonna use uh, tools like pen and paper and, and whiteboards to keep track of, of what's going on within your operation. And to be fair, it, it's pretty efficient on a day-to-day -day basis, but the issue is that now beekeepers are facing many threats like climate change, um, new diseases, you know, exposure to pesticides, poor in, environmental forage, Etc. So as you're moving through your season, you're essentially deleting all of the data that could be useful for you to collect um, and then retrospect on it. Next slide. And uh, right, so like beekeepers right now are losing about 50% of their livestock on an annual basis and they need to rebuild that livestock every year to be able to meet with expectations or like market demand in terms of pollination services and, and, and honey production, which is Super costly, the costs are transferred to the farmers and then further down the value chain it, and we end up essentially paying for it at the grocery store uh, for all of these crops that, that fully depend on honeybee health. Um, so the, uh, oh, just a percent slide. So when we uh, approached investors the first time, the uh, initial product that we had built was an in hive sensor, essentially. So our um, take on it was to say, okay, well, we're going to develop a in-hive sensor that's going to monitor the hive's health, and we're going to bring that information to the beekeepers, um, and that's going to provide them, you know, net new value. Um, and we essentially ended up using this approach to the market as a way to learn that the true issue, and then you can go to the next slide, Owen, um, is about this, these types of environment, right? So like this is, these are two almond orchards. The one on the left is pretty much sand and trees. And the one on the right has a beautiful diverse environment with here you're seeing like mustard flower cover cropping. So essentially like the, at the core of the issue is you've got honeybees that are exposed to different environments. Um, some of them are beneficial and some of them are not. Um, and beekeepers cannot keep track of moving, let's say 10,000 hives across multiple locations in a given season. So we're helping, we've decided to pivot our technological approach to help them assess that instead of focusing on what's going on inside the hive. Next slide. So we also took a very co-designed and iterative approach by working with beekeepers and, and academics into building the product. So on the left here, you see noise apiaries. They've been with us for three years now. And on the right, MCW apiaries based out of Alberta. Uh, noise in, is, is based in North Dakota. So with these beekeepers, we've uh, developed the product and onboarded more and more of them as years went by. Next slide. Um, and the technology, what it is now is we've got RFID tags attached to every honeybee colony in a given operation. So here you've got examples of them. Next slide. Which allows the beekeepers through the migratory path to uh, track the hives using their smartphones and pin their locations. So at the end of the season, we're able to not only retrospect on what has been working for them in terms of uh, livestock survivorship, but also we've started to do some predictions. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Go ahead. Um, so now we're working with beekeepers that represent over 300,000 honeybee colonies. It's really like an unprecedented amount of data that we're helping the industry track. Um, beekeepers we've worked with because we've used this approach, they love our products, our latest NPS score is at 67, um, which means that now, you know, we've been able to go into a phase where we're scaling up the use of, the, of our product, hence investments that we've been seeking for uh, the past couple of years. Next slide. Um, throughout these years and through some of the uh, uh, support that we've received, we've been able to uh, build a, a great team, which is obviously key beyond the technology. You want to be able to cover all aspects um, of, of the business as well as surround ourselves with a great advisory board on which uh, Owen is, uh, has a seat on and some scientific advisors, uh, pretty much the top of the industry. Next slide. Um, and where we're heading now, um, so here on the column called health score, a little circle with a uh, number in it, we're, we're starting to be able to do some predictive analysis based on the data 
that we've collected with the beekeepers to not only be able to show them an accurate picture of their operation and then look back at has, what has been working or not, but we're inching closer being able to provide them with um, prescriptive insights, right? So on what to do, how to do it to maximize survivorship and profitability. And that's going to be huge for the industry because right now they're pretty much going in blind in terms of uh, um, knowing what's going to come out of wintering sheds when they're going from one season to another and expecting to lose, you know, somewhere around half of their colonies, but sometimes it's a third, sometimes it's more. So we're going to be able to tell them exactly how many hives they're going to be losing. Um, next slide. Then finally, in the long term, we kind of have this uh, three-step plan to uh, bring systemic change to the food system. So the first one is where we're at. Um, helping beekeepers uh, provide a predictable supply of healthy colonies to the food system that needs them. Uh, the thing we're just getting into based on this uh, predictive capacity is optimize the distribution of uh, pollination resources, so namely honeybee colonies um, for crop growers that need them. And then find leverages, financial leverages to scale the adoption of bee-friendly farming and really make sure that the environment for bees and wild pollinators is improved throughout our conventional farming food system. So uh, that's it on our end. And we've been uh, um, super lucky and, and, and blessed to, to have uh, support from investors such as uh, Owen. Yeah, oh, and unfortunately, we uh, we can't hear you. How about now, Mark Andre? Yeah, we got you. Awesome. Um, so my name is Owen Callan. I'm with the Upper Canada Equity Fund, which is a place-based social impact fund headquartered in Prince Edward County in southeastern Ontario. And we were early investors in Nectar, as Mark Andre was talking about. And so I'll talk a little bit about making that investment and also zoom out and talk about the investor journey. Um, when I first met Mark Andre and the team at Nectar, they were in downtown Montreal and they had hives. Uh, stuck wherever they could put them. They were on rooftops, they were in vacant lots in downtown Montreal. Um, uh, they were busy harvesting data uh, from the hives and crunching it in the lab. And we made a judgment early as an investor that Nectar and the team had the data science capabilities, the machine learning know-how, the technical skills to be able to analyze the data, understand the problem, and start to build a practical solution. And so the key question then for us in terms of evaluating investment readiness became, is the team ready to get out of the lab and into the field? Were they ready to engage with beekeepers, farmers, rural communities, where they were at, and begin co-creating and iterating solutions alongside them. And so as we saw Nectar hit those milestones, um, we made our initial investment. As the engagement with rural communities deepened on the part of Nectar and ourselves, as investors, it became evident that farmers were under pressure. Um, floods that were supposed to be happening once every century were happening every couple of years. They were facing wildfires, um, droughts, and extreme weather events that were causing them losses. And so in response to these pressures, um, farmers were you know, considering clearing more land, getting rid of hedgerows, doubling down on cash crops, increasing their inputs, anything they could do to increase their volume in order to offset margin pressures. <laughs> And from our perspective, while these were understandable reflexes in the status quo environment, um, they're fundamentally and ultimately counterproductive. They erode natural defenses against things like floods, they subtract from biodiversity, and they make the environment more hostile uh, to pollinators. <clears throat> so the next question we started to assess when it came to investment readiness was, did Nectar have the capacity to mobilize entire communities? Now, why would we as an investor be 
concerned with mobilization of community? Well, a, a lot of times impact ventures are tackling problems that are tough, wicked problems. They have complex underlying root causes. Um, and in our view, the solution you're developing should reflect the nature of the problem. You should be able to get at root causes. Sometimes a single technical intervention won't suffice. Um, you may need to mobilize a system. So as an investor, we wanted to know, did Nectar have the wherewithal? Did they have the peripheral vision? Did they have the collaborative spirit uh, in their work? Did they have the network so that if they needed to mobilize a system, they had the ability to do so? And I would just say that more generally for us, we don't expect ventures to be ready on day one. Um, as investors, we can help them build capacity. We can play a role in that kind of mobilization. But we are at that point asking you know, more fundamental questions. What are the core values of the team? Are they driven by purpose? Because these things are usually indicators of their ability to take on this kind of a problem and, and mobilize. Um, as we got further into our journey with Nectar, um, roles started to become inverted. Um, the role of the portfolio company and the investor started to reverse. Um, the people started to become the teacher. And what I mean by that is that um, the insights we were getting from Marc Andre and from the data um, and analysis that Nectar was providing were nudging us to start asking questions. What would a bee friendly local food system look like? Um, and it became obvious after a time that we needed more diversity, more diversity at every link in the food supply chain. Who has access to capital? How land is stewarded? Which crops are grown? What foods are produced? Where they're distributed to? How they're consumed? How they're disposed of? And so that got us starting to ask, how do we get there? How can communities, how can social entrepreneurs play a role in leading that transition? What are the obstacles? Um, how can we integrate indigenous ways of knowing into land stewardship practices? What are the gaps in terms of access to capital for underrepresented communities and far-flung places? Um, and so that nudged us to finally ask ourselves, well, okay, what are we going to do about this as an investor? Um, and so just to give you, you know, uh, a, a sense of, of what we were reflecting on, we were asking, what does a bee friendly investment strategy look like? If we were going to build an investment portfolio that was friendly to pollinators, what would it be composed of? Um, and, you know, it, the couple of milestones along that journey included turning to the IRP, the Investment Readiness Program, backed by ESDC, and that provided support to engage um, Indigenous-led organizations, uh, rural communities, and investors around what would it take to shift the, the local food system. And that led to the launch of a net new social finance intermediary, the Bloom Local Food Fund, which is investing in food system transformation, a just transition, and economic reconciliation. Um, and so those were the, the really key milestones in the investor journey coming out of this initial investment in, in Nectar. In terms of what comes next in the investor journey, if we zoom out and look at the wider landscape in Canada, we know that you know, one of the most monumental historic um, developments in a long time for social finance in Canada is uh, Minister Gould's announcement on May 29th of $400 million for the social finance fund being allocated to three wholesalers, um, Boan, Realize, and Cap Finance. Uh, and those wholesalers are now accessible to social finance intermediaries. Um, so uh, an impact investment fund like Bloom can turn to a wholesaler for matching capital, uh, and then it can turn around and it can invest. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, you know, alongside matching investment from private sources, um, funds like Bloom can invest in social purpose organizations or SPOs. The SPOs could be uh, a farmer's co-op. It could be uh, a food entrepreneur uh, bringing uh, a food in from another culture like crickets as, as human food. It could be a herbal tea company that's indigenous owned. It could be a nonprofit that's selling fresh produce in a food desert, or it could be, could be the next nectar. 
Um, and so this, you know, this slide just gives you a, a little bit of a sense of what the flows are intended to look like. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we, uh, as we go through the session today. Uh, and so with that, I'll, I'll perhaps uh, hand it back to, uh, to Muska to, to pick it up from there. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Owen and Marc-Andre, for that very helpful presentation that really set the context well for the discussions uh, to follow. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce the rest of the speakers to join us for the panel portion of this event. Uh, first, we have Katie McIntyre. Katie is a fund manager at uh, Bloom Local Fund. Katie's work focuses on building sustainable and inclusive rural communities through place-based funds and initiatives in Canada that pursue financial and social returns. Katie's experience with working with asset owners through the full cycle of transactions. She also has supported entrepreneurs and, and companies launch, catalyze, and capacity build within the local food ecosystems in Prince Edward County. Last uh, but not least, we're joined by MJ Senna, uh, the investment principal at uh, Bloom Local uh, Food Fund. MJ is a social entrepreneur, operator, uh, and an investor. MJ has helped build a multi-million dollar micro loan portfolio in rural India and a cooperative that served over 200 women entrepreneurs. Through his advisory firm, he has helped deploy over $400 million through private market impact investing, and another $500 million through responsible investment strategies for family offices, funds, foundations, including the Hamilton Community Foundation, the Kitchener-Waterloo Community Foundation, the Upper Canada Equity Fund, and the Bloom Local Food Fund. Uh, in addition, MJ is the board uh, and an investment committee of several other foundations. Thank you so much for uh, joining us, Katie and MJ. Uh, and now uh, back to Owen to lead the discussions. Awesome, thanks, Muska. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess we'll we'll start maybe at the beginning. I know that uh, Katie and MJ, you were both um, involved in in Nectar's journey in terms of investment. Um, let's start with how you first learned about Nectar. So whoever wants to take that. Oh, sure, maybe. Uh... I, I, I'll jump in because I, I think I go way back with Marc-Andre. So I, I had the sheer luck and pleasure of first seeing Marc-Andre at a pitch event in Montreal about five years ago. And I followed Nectar's uh, fundraising and investment journey ever since. So I found his story initially very compelling. I was very impressed with the product, the company, as well as the team. Um, but really as a passionate kitchen gardener, um, I've really learned how essential pollinators are. So I've always been excited about nectar and how they help to raise healthier bees to really secure the food supply. Um, so that's how I stumbled upon them. What about you, MJ? Thanks, Katie. Uh, thanks, Owen. Thanks, Mark Andre. And thanks everyone for joining us today and Mr. and team for uh, hosting this. So uh, I ended up actually doing a deeper dive uh, earlier this year, um, advising the Upper Canada Equity Fund on a transaction, but I was uh, going through my files and I've read and followed uh, Nectar for almost two years now. Um, I'm an engineer by training. I love the, you know, the intersection of innovation, social change, technology. And so very was very intrigued by, you know, the, uh, Kiri, as you said about you know, bees, right? Like, uh, slowly, I sat on a board of a foundation that focused on food, and we just chatted about how we are slowly forgetting how food comes from. It doesn't come from grocery stores. It does come from the fields and farms, and you know, what are the different aspects of uh, what happens on the whole uh, value chain. So yeah, I was very intrigued by uh, you know the nature, sustainability B side, the strong team, uh, as, as Owen mentioned, and, and, uh, and then a great business case. And yeah, so two years back, learned about it, had the pleasure of doing a deeper dive earlier this year and uh, very excited to see where things go. Excellent. Um, and Mark andre maybe we'll turn it to you. Um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, of, of SBOs in the audience, you know, folks that, who are involved throughout the ecosystem. Um, what were some of the key barriers for you and Nectar in raising capital? Um, I think the obvious one for us was that uh, beekeeping is a niche market um, and that it is a relatively small market if you look at, you know, uh, kind of the raw transactions that happen within this industry. 
so since the beginning and even still today, in some cases, it, it can be a barrier, which, um, you know, uh, often like challenges like this will, will, will push you to further your thinking on how you're looking at the impact you want to generate and then the market opportunity and all that. Uh, and in our case, having uh, to face this challenge throughout the years has, I think, really pushed us to better define the impact that we could generate by providing technology to beekeepers as on one hand, it's a relatively niche industry. That being said, it's kind of a blue ocean in terms of potential for digitization because everything is analog. Like there is nothing digitized. They barely have websites. Um, and then looking at how you may be able to impact from beekeeping into, you know, the I think according to the FAO, it's like $575 billion worth of food that fully depend on honeybee pollination, right? So like being able to tie in your impact today with beekeepers to in the future, uh, putting in the, the kind of the stepping stones to have this impact on securing this, this uh, amount of, of food um, and amount of market size has been key for us afterwards into, um, into be able to raise money either with investors or grants or et cetera. Um, and turning back to MJ and Katie, um, what were the most important factors that you considered when deciding when deciding to invest in an organization? Uh, I can go first on this one, if that's okay with you, Katie. So um, I would say a few things. A bucket uh, one is you know, one is the impact that's being created. So impact both, uh, and that's helpful for I, I would believe from the audience, like impact in the absolute sense, but impact in context of who is investing. I would advise folks who will not touch tech but will do affordable housing and vice versa. So, you know, what is focus for uh, Bloom? So I would say impact would be uh, one aspect. Financial track record, if there is one, uh, especially on the debt lending side. Uh, but, you know, a lot of, you know, early stage businesses, then you look at more as things like, you know, cash burn, how sustainable is, is you know, is, is the growth path. Uh, in, I'm a big believer of sustainable growth and, and uh, you know, um, uh, you know, sustainable uh, cash burn. So I would say that would be the other part. Investment parameters would be the uh, another part of it, which is how does it fit with, you know, Bloom's in or Upper Canada Equity Fund's investment thesis? You know, what kind of returns, terms, you know, um, all, all those aspects you're looking for, including, you know, geographic focus would be one factor. And then uh, validating the business model, you know, what do they do, uh, you know, uh, I'll go back to one of those um, Airbnb pitch decks. You know, what's the problem? What's the solution? Who else is out there? What makes you better, faster, cheaper? So, so that kind of on the market competition. Um, and and I would say finally, this is my opinion that uh, and having done a lot of fund investing, so invest as you all know, like we're investing in early stage funds or investing in early entrepreneurs. I think at the end of the day, what I've learned over the last seven, ten years is it's about people. Uh, stuff goes wrong, stuff, go, you know, but it's more about, uh, and that's how life is, but it's, it's more about, you know, uh, finding the right people and, uh, and, and, and championing and letting them do their thing. That's been my, my thesis. So that comes from both the technical side of thing, I would say on people. One side is, you know, do they have, you know, experience, knowledge, Sometimes you may not have all the aspects and that's totally fair to, you know, uh, Mark and I talked about the advisors, like who else are you bringing together? What kind of team are you building? And then that team part also, uh, you know, ends up becoming a lot of reference calls, uh, you know, chatting with people about what people think. And then uh, there becomes common themes on, on uh, you know, what, what comes out. So, yeah, I would say those would be a few things. Impact, financial, investment, the market opportunity business uh, competition and then team would be the team would be the last but the most important in my view katie what do you uh, think yeah i think that's fantastic uh list that's why i love being a colleague with you because you know those are exactly the things we really drill down on but you know just to carry on on that last point about the team and about the people you know one thing I would add is that we do look at measures beyond the balance sheet so we do look at um, and, and want to value the unique challenges that entrepreneurs may face uh, coming through an investment journey and consider consider how factors like systematic racism and other challenges may have affected that journey to date um, and looking at that as part of that whole evaluation package 
Cool. Uh, that's a lot of questions that investors consider, Mark Andre. It's a potentially heavy load. Um, from Nectar's perspective, uh, you know, how would you change the way investors approach the due diligence process? How could they improve that for from the perspective of a venture of an SPO? Um, instead of focusing on what has to change, I'll focus on the times that it's been kind of a fun process. And I don't think you will hear that often that, um, that the due diligence process is a fun one, or uh, let's say it's not always constructive because the moments where it either like hasn't gone well or was like very tedious for us was when, um, and I, I kind of get why, but like investors were trying to use like cookie cutters type of ways to uh, evaluate the business. And not really dive down, dive down into kind of the qualitative aspect or of like what's the industry like um, and really understand kind of what are what what the sales process are going to be like or like the sales cycles and like how is marketing really working in that industry and not simply trying to replicate what maybe some of their uh, successful other portfolio companies have been doing so the couple of times that we've done this process with investors has led to not even just like being a smooth process but even more in terms of uh, having like constructive conversations that have pushed our team to advance some of the thoughts that we already had when the investor is challenging you on, well, you know, we see that you're doing X today, but have you thought about expanding into Y at some point? And then you, like, you're ready to consider some of this, uh, especially when the investor brings in this, uh, you know, some level of expertise in agribusiness, for example, or like deep with an impact, et cetera. Um, and then based on that, like, it, yeah, it, it pushes the team to improve the quality of the company. Um, that being said, as a, an entrepreneur, then you still have to be ready to provide the right information to fill in like the, the, the basic um, questions that a typical investor would have for you throughout the due diligence process. You know, make sure that your e unit economics work, that your narrative uh, between you know, what you say, your pitch deck, and then your financial projections, like everything is aligned and works, uh, which initially for me as a product designer was not an easy task to do like in the very beginning, I would say like now it's, it's, it's better, but, um, and just, you know, keeping your house in order in terms of data throughout the year and, you know, not wait until someone asks it for it, because then you've got like, you know, weeks of work to make sure you've got everything together. But if you've got curious investors that are, are, are genuinely, um, you know, genuinely want to improve the space and, you know, benefit from the space that you want to work in, usually it leads to uh, great conversations. Awesome. Okay, thanks. Um, MJ, shifting over to the investor side, how do you work with potential investees? How do you engage SBOs? What does that What does that look like? Um, thanks, Owen. So I would say you know starts with you know an initial conversation that could have happened through any way. It could happen through you know folks reaching out to us, meeting at you know uh, industry events, conferences, or us coming across something that's interesting. Um, you know, ideal process would be, you know, so once once you have that early conversation, you get a sense of, okay, what, what do folks do? And then, uh, you know, a brief synopsis internally. Uh, so step two being like, you know, brief discussion or, you know, a one page or synopsis in, internally around, okay, you know, what's what's the key, uh, you know, what are the key, key factors here? You know, I mentioned some of the parameters. So what, what, what makes sense? And then moving towards uh, you know a deeper due diligence, which involves uh, a lot of factors that I mentioned in, in in the previous note. So I think that would be kind of the process. Uh, so starting with again initial conversation, uh, putting together you know having ensuring the team internally is on the same page. Then moving towards a deeper deeper dive. Uh, yeah, I, I would say that would be the piece. Uh, I have learned this, and candidly, I haven't always been very good at this but i feel uh, keeping folks informed on the other end as some of you who know me i'm very interested in funder funding investor investing dynamics and to be more equitable and balanced so i would add a note on to say that kind of a tag along to last comment by mark andre as well that you know uh, folks when when you're working with uh, you know in, you know working with investors like i think uh, keeping them informed throughout as much as possible and sometimes you have a much quicker decision making. Sometimes it could be slower. Uh, there's different contexts, but keeping folks informed. And uh, again, another piece that I haven't been the best at, but I try is 
no, uh, what I've learned is a slow, a quick no is sometimes better than a, you know, a very slow yes. So um, again, with the acknowledgement that I haven't done, done my best on, on these, but something that I do try to aspire towards. So that's what my context around the, the technical side of the process, but also the back end philosophy or thinking around balance, communication, uh, and maybe trying to put the, the yourself in the other person's shoes. So I'll stop there if that made any sense. That's super helpful. Um, I have a follow-up question for you, Katie, but is, is there anything you want to add on how you engage with investees? I mean, I think MJ painted a really clear picture of how we try and go about it. And it's also great to have feedback from Mark andre right here on how we as, as investors can go through these processes more clearly and more supportively and, and more collaboratively. So no, I think that's great. And, uh, and it's always good to have, you know, clear emails. Mark andre is uh, very good at keeping up to date uh, with everything that's going on. And that's something that's, uh, that we would like as investors to keep our ears on the ground. And, and sometimes it's easiest if it comes in your inbox. So right on. Cool. Um, so if you're working in the investor sphere, there's, you know, an elephant that just walked into the room, a very welcome elephant, and that's the, the social finance fund. Um, uh, we saw in the poll off the top that folks have, um, you know, in some instances, a reasonable grasp of the social finance fund, but the bulk of folks are still navigating, they're still exploring. That was the, the plurality, the largest cohort. Um, so maybe you could just talk about engaging the social finance fund from the perspective of, of the Bloom Local Food Fund. What, you know, how are you approaching that as a social finance intermediary? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think it's something that's really, you know, it's very exciting. It's a real kind of historic landmark in the development of social finance in Canada. It's really um, a great new model for funding social progress. And, and I think for intermediaries like Bloom, uh, both existing or emerging, um, it's really encouraging and exciting uh, to see this type of activity because we all share the same overall goals of the social finance fund, um, building that resilient social finance market, creating positive impacts and good environmental impacts and advancing social equity by providing more access to capital for um, underserved populations uh, and regions, including kind of the rural areas that we target. So when we hear um, these kind of developments, it really gets us excited and also encourages some wind in our sails that we're all kind of uh, moving in great directions that we need to go as a, as a country. So um, with Bloom, you know, we invest in social purpose organizations. And so with the investment readiness program, we've been really excited to see how the social finance fund can implement amplify the impacts um, in all the communities that we serve. So at that intermediary level, Bloom um, is seeking from the social finance fund some matching repayable investments. So that could be used to provide patient and value aligned capital um, in the form of both equity and debt um, to social purpose organizations like Nectar or like many of the uh, wonderful organizations we have in this region and across the country. So this capital really kind of gets co-invested into social enterprises, both for-profit and non-profit, um, with that aim of shifting, um, for us, the local food system so that it can be both more bee-friendly, but also can foster more inclusive economies. Um, and when we see things like that for Nectar, um, I think things like the rollout of the Social Finance Fund is really expected to increase the availability of these types of financial supports to so social purpose organizations like Nectar and like many others. Awesome. Um, since folks um, in the polls indicated that they were still navigating, we've dropped a few links into the chat. Um, so there's a link to the three social finance fund wholesalers, Boan, Realize, and Cat Finance. Um, and then uh, I know that Boan is running on LinkedIn a sort of Q&A series where they've been fielding popular questions and, uh, and responding to them and sharing slides and so on. So I've provided a link to that as well. And anyone who's on the call that wants to drop on links or resources um, that they think would be useful for that, those that are, are navigating, or maybe they're, you know, they've, they've got a, a good amount of knowledge, um, but they're still, you know, trying to anticipate what comes next. I know there's a lot of chatter amongst uh, peer funds about um, the opportunity for the social finance fund to catalyze the emergence of black led and brown led intermediaries, lots of conversations in rural communities about making sure they don't get left behind. So there's a moment of a lot of anticipation and expectations and, and would certainly welcome um, folks dropping into the chat 
you know, your biggest hope or fear or, uh, or, or question, um, it's a, it's a, it's a big moment, um, with respect to the social finance fund and we'll, we'll field those out to the relevant audiences so they can keep that in mind in their communications. Maybe I'll just put you on the spot briefly, MJ, um, and just, just, you know, in terms of, you know, where are you on the, the gradient of optimism with respect to the social finance fund, this intervention, you know, catalyzing emerging managers? Uh, thanks, Owen, and no worries. Uh, I think those who know me know that I'm, you know, the more I live life, the more I'm moving towards cautious optimism, but still optimism, um, I, I would say. Uh, so, you know, uh, I am a settler, so I'm in Canada, I moved here 10 years back. So I've worked in a few countries in impact investing in India, you know, Western Europe, North America. And so the wholesaler model has been helpful in market building. Think of big society capital and the work they did in uh, in, in the UK. So, um, uh, and, and the VCCI initiative in Canada that helped uh, on the venture capital side, build the market space for, uh, you know, fund investing that deployed capital eventually. So, so I would say uh, this was one of the recommendations of the Social Finance Task Force 10 years back. Uh, this model has uh, uh, proven helpful in, in a bunch of countries, including including in the UK. So I'm, I'm optimistic about, uh, you know, a few things. One is more flow of capital, you know, plain and simple. Two is, uh, you know, the government firms like the Boeing's and the Realize and Cap Finance coming together. Uh, greater legitimacy in, 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 in the broader market, because sometimes I wonder, like, are we just patting each other on the back and you know, everyone outside will be like, oh, you guys are dumb. So I hope not. But the point is, you know, actual money, like my, my point always been like, you know, show me the money. So I think it increases flow of capital, increases legitimacy. I think, uh, you know, government capital and functioning democracies and welfare societies, in my view, at least, uh, have a role not just profit seeking, but you know, building a more equitable society, a more equitable community. So the opportunity, the third part is the opportunity for these funds. I'm not saying that's what they do and I have no influence or relation with any of these funds or uh, folks is going in early, you know, taking risks. Sometimes those risks are perceptional, sometimes those risks are real, but you know, uh, unless you try something, you will never know. Uh, so I think those could really, um, you know, spur innovation. I'll, I'll I'll uh, make a quick point. I have a colleague of mine, a good friend. He's Australian, uh, worked in India, Australian Indian, worked in India, UK, US, and we chatted about how Canada, Australia are pretty similar. But we felt, you know, there is a bit of less risk taking, and we felt in the government support and welfare society and you know social security setting inhibits some of that. People are like, oh, you know, some. So I think on the other end, that's more of like a need based. This is more of a you know, push from, from uh, you know, through the social finance fund that let's do more. So I'll, I'll stop there. That cautious optimistic have seen this work, was one of the recommendation, will help one more supply of capital, uh, legitimizes things. And uh, the ability of something like the social finance wholesalers to take a, you know, long-term view, go in early, take risk capital, uh, and all that too, in my view, concluding by saying, I'm very interested in democ democratizing supply and demand of capital, I think I'm hopeful. I'm cautiously hopeful. That said, I will say, uh, this is not my forte, uh, who knows, like I'm not, you know, uh, the pace is gonna be likely, just based on how governments work, the pace is likely gonna be not the super quickest, but I think those are for, you know, fund investment cycles are also 12 to 14 year. You, you know, you have to think through those things. You have to think through how uh, all those aspects are gonna work. So I think, uh, those things will take time, but just because that's how some it government, some of it, how fund investment works. Uh, yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah, I mean, there's some upside on the pacing, arguably, depending on your perspective. If, if like many folks in the poll responses, you're navigating, you're at an early stage, you are, uh, maybe you've conceived of a social finance uh, tool or intervention that is needed for the problem you're tackling or the community that um, you're rooted in, um, 
you know, my read and understanding is that there are opportunities to get supports from the wholesaler to develop net new um, social finance intermediaries, to develop new funds that can go on to receive investments from the wholesalers. And so, um, you know, the investments will take place initially over a five-year period and then ultimately over a 16-year period. And so there's, in theory and uh, presumably in practice, going to be opportunities for folks to participate in that along the way. So that pace will allow some folks to get ready and, and, and catch up. Um, Mark Andre, I want to bring you back in. Uh, MJ's been talking about sort of uh, balance um, between pace and inclusion and, and other factors. At the SPO level, and there's lots of SPOs uh, with us on the line, um, how do you balance financial returns and social and environmental returns? And, and once you tackle that, what advice do you have for social purpose organizations on creating that balance with their, within their own organizations? Um, I think I'll go straight into the advice um, because it's also going to be my answer. Um, essentially, I think it's your responsibility to find a powerful financial engine to be able to accomplish your impact. Um, I don't know about a lot of cases of at least in non uh, sorry for profit organizations where um, providing systemic impact or like you know deep impact or large impact at scale is going to be possible if you're not able to fuel that engine um, you can still consider finances as a means and not the end and that's kind of based on your values and and you know who you are as an individual but at the end of the day in our case like we we found that um, you need to be able to provide value um, and monetize and, and return some of the um, kind of tie in the impact to the value that you're providing. And then again, a bit like the due diligence question earlier, um, getting pushed or like pushing yourself, I should say pushing yourself uh, to find that intersection between uh, impact and generating financial value, I think is critical for your company. And that's something that you're going to need to do anyways, at some point, if you want to be successful. Um, so, so yeah, that's my answer and advice. Great. Um, we were talking about how the social finance fund has an explicit directive around um, social inclusion. Um, so MJ or Katie, can you talk about the role of diversity and social inclusion in the investment decision-making process? Sure, I'll jump in first um, and just kind of, you know, really at the fund level, justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, this is all at the center of the work that we do at the Bloom Local Food Fund. We're really seeking to knock down the barriers um, to access capital that have historically been faced by equity deserving groups. So it's really what we think all funds should be doing and, uh, and, and it's really centered to how we operate. So um, this means really looking at shifting power and making changes to who makes decisions uh, about how capital is allocated um, and additionally, uh, you know, in proving this, our fund is signed up for um, the Canada's 50-30 challenge. So we are committed to have at least 50% gender parity and 30% representation from equity deserving groups at the governance of our organization. And it's something that we look at for our investees as well and see how that um, is present in their organizations. Um, MJ, anything to add? Um, no, that was great. I think uh, maybe I'll just say uh, what I learned from a fund manager I look up to is, uh, you know, on the overarching, you know, long back, a uh, large fund manager from India, he said, you know, our work is around, you know, helping move capital to sectors, geographies, and individuals that have been, you know, uh, not a part of the capital markets to build a more, you know, better world. So, you know, geography, sustainable food, agriculture, uh, you know, you know sector-wise, geography, southeastern Ontario. There is, you know, more concentration. So I think all kind of, uh, you know, uh, and, and and communities that have been, uh, you know, uh, excluded. So so yeah, I, I would say nothing to add, but just keeping that in mind all the time uh, around being the steward. Uh, yeah. Okay, I'm sticking with you guys for a moment. You you know, we talked about launching the Bloom Local Food Fund. Um, that's a project that a number of us have been a, a part of. Um, in short, what are you trying to do? Katie, do you want to first? Oh, well, I think we're both equally passionate, so we'd have to draw straws. But here, why don't you go for this one first? Sure. 
Uh, sure. Uh, so, you know, it's a Bloom Local Food Fund. We are based out of uh, it's a mixed debt and equity fund, uh, which is a partnership between Upper Canada Equity Fund as well as uh, the Social Venture Ex Exchange, SVX in Toronto. So it's it's going to be a um, half debt, mixed mixed debt and equity fund focused on southeastern Ontario. Uh, and as I said, you know, sustainable food, agriculture based businesses with a focus on trying to meet folks where they're at. So, you know, it could be nectar and the intersection of technology, food, innovation, bees. It could be on, on the equity side, it could be debt, and it could be, we have chatted in my trips and conversations and uh, folks from, you know, communities know this much better than I do around uh, the challenges of, uh, you know, family farms and how to manage financing if, you know, some, the next generation wants to, you know, the, early generation wants to retire, the next generation wants to come in. How does that work? So I think quite a quite a uh, bit of breath. So yeah, I'll, I'll stop, keep it keep it sh short, but um, partnership between Upper Canada Equity Fund and SVX, uh, debt and equity uh, focus I talked about, kind of businesses we will 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 look at. And we are uh, we are ready for business, both on the race, race uh, we are actively, you know, raising capital and we are actively in conversations with uh, organizations to, you know, build a pipeline. So, uh, Kitty. Yeah, no, I think that's a great kind of shakedown of our details of who we are and what we're trying to do, just to paint out the picture a little bit more of the problem that we are trying to address and, and enhance the communities that we serve. So, you know, as we as Owen kind of mentioned earlier, just to underscore, we are really a place-based um, social impact fund, and we're investing with an equity lens into food system transformation, um, economic reconciliation, and a just transition for rural communities. So we know that our food systems need farm to fork integrated solutions, Things like nectar play a huge role in 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 our food systems um, throughout the supply chain um, and we need to transition to a new economy and really kind of secure our food sovereignty however we know a lack of capital can really impede this transition especially in Canada we know that Canada's food systems face a funding gap of hundreds of millions of dollars um, many BIPOC led women led or uh, ventures led by gender diverse individuals face capital scarcity and that some um, you know food uh, investment opportunities are lacking throughout the country so we're really looking to increase access to capital in our region um, and you know where social finance investors are limited can be sometimes in rural areas um, and we work with our investment partners to you know really deepen the impact in uh, in both social and financial returns um, and really kind of uh, mobilize communities to really get us shifting to more local and regenerative economies. So we're very passionate about what we do and uh, we're so excited to, you know, hear stories like Nectar um, because it, it kind of is exactly the, the proof in the marketplace of what we all need to be doing to strengthening and enhancing biodiversity um, and diversity as well. Cool. Awesome. Um, and Mark, try, we'll turn it over to you. We've, you know, there's been a lot of talk about impact. Um, how have you been thinking and approaching um, measuring uh, and reporting on impact and nectar? I'm sure it's been a, an evolution. Uh, what are some of your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, so kind of like the financial engine, to me, the um, impact you're going to measure on should be interestingly uh, linked with the value of the product or service that you're providing to the people paying for it. Um, so in our case, for example, like the, um, what we want to achieve is be able to determine the, you know, first the number of hives that we're tracking, that would be like the bare minimum. Um, that's something we need to know internally anyways. Uh, second thing is tying in the, um, impact of our product directly on our client's livelihood. So honeybee health, um, metrics such as survivorship and um we re requeening rates but then we're like we'd be really getting into like more beekeeping technical stuff um something that we're starting to measure is uh improvements in profitability based on our product and then ultimately what we want to see is also changes in land management practices uh for farmers that benefit from honeybee pollination now i guess something to um, make, kind of be careful about is when you're setting expectations with investors at the beginning, like we were very excited to say, we're gonna measure all these things and we're gonna have all this impact and you know everything is for tomorrow. But in reality, like it's, it, it has taken us a few years to even get to be tracking colonies 
So now like we're just getting into impacting survivorship and then in a year from now, profitability and probably in a few years from now, we're gonna be looking at um, impacting uh, land management. So, so there is a pace to set with your investors in terms of making sure that they've got the right expectations because like we've had, I don't know if I would call them frustrations, but like in the past, like people were expecting that you know, from day one, we'd be reporting on land management changes. It's like, well, we're collecting data. It's going to take you know five years before we start working with policymakers on a broad scale to um, improve you know the habitat of bees. In the meantime, what we can do though is is help beekeepers alleviate some of the uh, land management impacts. So, uh, yeah. And generally, do you find that when it comes to impact measurement and reporting, that investors tend to sort of be be stepping on the gas? They're you know anxious to get there quickly, or you know, are some hitting the break? Uh, how does that sort of dynamic work? Um, is it the the venture that's sort of racing ahead of itself, or is it is it the investors, or is it both, or what have those dynamics been like? I don't know for others, but in our case, it's been a bit of a, uh, I would say, both parties looking to provide the accurate reporting, um, and because it's been, you know, for for us, like company performance metrics are interestingly linked with what reporters, uh, sorry, with the, what investors are looking to report on. So it's not like we had to create um, net new metrics for the investors to track. Um, that being said, the investors we've surrounded ourselves with uh, were hungry for the beginning to, to, to have these metrics. It's not like we imposed it on them or like we've, we've made them discover something new. Um, one of our um, so we also work with Real Ventures, who's more of a traditional VC firm based in Montreal. And one of the things that Sylvain Cal, who used to work there initially, um, told me in the very beginning is that at the end of the day, like you're pretty much trying to find investors that are already convinced that your problem exists and that your solution should happen. And if you show up in a room and have to convince everyone on these two matters, then you're probably not going to get the investment, right? Then it's probably a, a good good thing um, because afterwards it makes sure that everybody's expectations are aligned and what you're gonna be reporting on is gonna be shared because at the, um, I would say like in most cases, you're trying to do, you know, keep the same amount of work that you've got to do to grow your company and then report with investors. Like you're trying to keep it at the same level. If you've got to do, you know, 20% more work just for reporting, you know, it's, it's gonna be a hurdle in the future. So, yeah. Got it. Let's say there are SPOs out there, they're, they're, you know, they've got product market fit, they're getting validation, they're showing traction, investors are, are, are beginning to circle, they're taking an interest. Um, do you think that alignment in terms of values, alignment in terms of appreciation of, of the problem um, is a particularly important consideration for a, for a venture, for an impact venture, or you know, do you, is it you know, cash is king, you know, take the check? The answer to that is it depends. It depends on where, you know, what's your financial position, how much you need the money, et cetera. Um, but I, I would think that, uh, I mean, we've seen it with, with some of our competition where um, companies have taken in large sums of financing in 2021 with investors that were not necessarily aligned with um, their market approach or like what it needed to succeed in a market such as beekeeping that hasn't seen a lot of digitization happen. And then from what we're hearing between the branches now, like the investors are kind of having a hard time with the current uh, economic markets and the slowdown in terms of funding versus like the adoption rate of technology and, and beekeeping. So, so I would think that in that case, it, it's probably creating some issues for the companies that have taken the sorts of, of, of money. Um, that being said, like you may be surprised, like when you're hitting tough times, like maybe, you know, you, you'll be positively surprised by some of your investors, but to me, it's important, but at the same time, like if, if your company is about to die and like you desperately need that money and that's, you know, that or nothing, then you probably need to take the cash, but it's probably going to come at some price, not in terms of equity in the future, but in terms of, you know, ease of work. Um, yeah. Um, how difficult has it been for Nectar to figure out which problem it's going to solve and, and who it's sort of key users and customers are at its different stages of development. You've painted a picture of a of a of a uh, a journey with a number of key milestones that ultimately is going to have impacts at many layers of the food system and uh, and beyond. How easy or difficult has it been to sort of map out those milestones and figure out which problem you're trying to solve at which stage of your journey? 
for us, it's been, I would say, fairly difficult um, between now and uh, between, yeah, now in the beginning, in a sense where we were new to this industry. It's, it's uh, for most people in the business, at least like on the management team, it, it was our first company uh, when we started. So, um, and we were going into an industry that we didn't know that much about. Like we were passionate about beekeeping, but there's a difference between being passionate. Like as you, you know, the picture you, sh you showed at the beginning of like us working with 10 hives on a rooftop and then, you know, having an in-depth conversation. Like I just came back from the Dakotas last week and we had like an in-depth conversation about, you know, how the industry is going and on a policy level, you know, with beekeepers that manage, you know, 30,000 hives, 50,000 hives, 80,000 hives. And, you know, between, I would say like 2017, when we really started and, and, and today, uh, we're able to challenge this pe these people into thinking like, what could you do better to run your operation and then, you know, improve yourself as an industry. Whereas in the beginning, you know, we were very much, you know, pun intended newbies in the industry um, and having to learn as much as possible. So product market fit for us as, was a challenge. Like, as I showed, we started with sensors. Turns out it was a wrong technology to have it, uh, uh, an improved impact. And then we looked at, do we want to work with the beekeepers? Do we want to work with the growers that rent hives for pollination services? Do we want to rent, uh, work with the people that end up buying the almonds afterwards? And, or do we want to work with the, the governments? And if you try to do everything at the same time, um, as you've seen, because we've kind of tried that, Owen, uh, in the past, uh, you end up diluting your efforts and then you're re not really progressing as a business. So you need to find ways to quickly go through iterations and see you know, what sticks and then decide on with the information you have. And sometimes it's decisions that are based on a you know, 41, uh, 51, 49 basis. So like, this is where we need to focus our efforts first um, to see uh, if it's gonna pay off. So yeah, I, I'd say that that's been our, our approach so far. I think now we're more focused than ever, but every now and then there's like an opportunity that comes from the outside and you're like, oh, that seems interesting. Like maybe we should tackle that. And then it's like, no, like let's, let's refocus and make sure we, we deliver on the plan. Uh, plan your work, work your plan. Sounds like sound advice. Yeah. Okay. Um, Katie and MJ, we've been hearing from Mark andre about, about the journey in a couple of different respects. Um, was there anything that surprised you about Nectar from that sort of first exposure you were describing to you know, where they went next? Uh, Katie, you want to go first or? Oh, go for it, MJ. Uh, so I think it was uh, for me, uh, you know, personally a reminder about you know food does come from farms and and the role you know, it, it is uh, like it is literally survival necessity. So uh, and the role the bees play in it and the impact our uh, you know our, our lives are having on 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 this ecosystem. So so it was just a good grounding reminder. Uh, I was impressed by the strong team. Uh, so you know. Very, you you talked a bit about this Owen earlier. So you know, very strong team coming together to work on a problem that is like hopefully doesn't get to a life and death point, but it is a very existential uh, issue, and that's also heartwarming to see. Because uh, I have been on both private sector and public sector engineer in MBA by training, working in social finance. It's it's all it's it's great to see that the market. You know, great talented people like Mark Andre and, and the team are putting their time, money, energy, wisdom towards uh, you know societal, true societal problems. In my view, so that was heartwarming for me, uh, and 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 validates the that you know you can do well and do good. You know, money can have conscience. You know, social impact and investment return can have an intersection. And then I'll conclude by saying just on those lines that uh, Mark and I talked about real ventures, right? So. Uh, and and there are other other funders that have you know other investors that have worked with uh, you know uh, Nectar and team both on grant side from you know federal government a bunch of so it it, it shows that it's nice to see that intersection of uh, you know what was a bit more siloed many years back that the space is evolving so yeah I'll, I'll just say that it's a grounded to remind get reminded of about food the role of bees and then excited to see different folks coming together and hopefully you know. Uh, in the future, uh, more of this kind of, uh, you know, uh, intersection of change and returns comes together. So we'll stop there. Katie, what about you? 
Yeah, I mean, for me, it's probably the scale of when I first encountered Marc Andre. Um, you know, I wasn't looking from a food lens or equity lens. We were, I was actually intrigued by the technology in and of itself. And as I've kind of gone and grown in my understanding of the the food system throughout, you know, our investor journey with Bloom, um, you know, it's really impressive. Uh, you know, as Marc Andre said, starting from ten hives to now, the kind of market that's available, really understanding that market um, and scaling to to meet and fit within that market. Um, it, you know, I, I don't think I had visioned uh, the growth as, as large as it is. So I'm very, um, maybe not surprised, but delighted to see that you guys have really, you know, learned about uh, uh, the market in a way that is much more um, holistic and, in, and, you know, inclusive when it comes to the way that beekeeping fits in the food change at all the different levels. So that's been wonderful to, to hear and to learn. And I think it's it's very unique, the, the section that you've carved out in the market and are really uh, scaling to fit it. So right on. Awesome. Okay. Um, we have lots of questions that are building up in the Q&A, so we're going to want to turn to them shortly. Um, but we've got a lot of SPOs around the table. They've been uh, peppering uh, the chat with questions, as you see, Marc-Andre. Um, what is your advice, intangible, specific advice for other uh, impact ventures, social purpose organizations that are looking to become investment ready? Um, man, we've made so many mistakes. It's kind of hard to, uh, decide which one I should give an advice on just to get started. I'd say like, probably not drink too much your own Kool-Aid, like drag, drink just as the, the right amount, right? Like you, you've got to be overly optimistic on your company's potential when you're starting from, you know, pretty much nothing. And, 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 you know, what you want to show investors and yourself is that you're going to conquer the world. Right. So like you've, you've got to be Ill, like just the right amount disillusional um to be able to pull that off i think then at the same time you don't want to fall too much in love with your solution you want to fall in love with a problem that that then you get validation you know concrete validation from the market that your potential solution is going to answer a need and people are willing to pay for it i would say that's that's relevant for spos but really like any types of startups and non-for-profits like any organization that's, that's trying to provide value to anyone you want to make sure that what you are projecting to investors and to actually like your different stakeholders, like yourself, your team members, um, clients, et cetera, is, is, you know, grounded in reality and not just something that you believe they're going to be, um, happy to pay for and then benefit from. So, so I think to me, that's probably the, uh, the thing that's going to make you investment ready. And then the second thing is kind of the classic thing of, of, of looking at, okay, well, you know, is it a billion dollar market, et cetera. Um, what's what are you, am I, am I solving like the, 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 is, is my solution really solving the systemic impact that I'm pointing finger at saying like, that's a problem, right? Cause we've seen it also is, uh, even in, in, in our case, sometimes like we understand that there is a limit to where we're going to be able to go just because of, you know, we're not going to solve climate change, for example, it's still like a huge issue and, and beekeepers do, um, you know, they're, they're, they're getting impacted by it. You know, can we do our part within climate change? Yes. Um, can we help, you know, have better soil quality and more biodiversity, et cetera. But, you know, we're not the company that's going to be solving climate change as a whole. And um, sometimes you're like, well, am I doing enough? And sometimes it's like, well, you know, it's going to take a village anyway. So I'm going to do my part. Yeah, I would say that from an investor perspective, folks falling in love with the solution and not the problem is is a you know is probably one of the key ways to get um, diverted onto the wait and see track. Um, uh, you know, starting with that, you know, as we as you captured eloquently, uh, Mark Andre, the uh, the problem you're trying to solve, and then continue to be flexible in iterating the solution. Um, to, to tackle that problem based on feedback from stakeholders, from the market, um, and from the impacts that you're having, rather than be attached to a particular solution and uh, and, and pursue it at, at, at all costs. So that's very uh, sage advice and certainly resonates from uh, an investor perspective. Uh, okay, I think we want to, we got uh, quite a, a, a batch of questions building up, so I think we want to turn to them. Um, just before we do, maybe I'll just ask Muska if there's anything that she wants to um, uh, add at this point, but I can see the, the questions queued up here, so I'm happy to jump straight into them. Yes, please go for it, uh, Owen. 
Excellent. Thanks, Muska. Um, so, you know, we've got folks who are talking about the very beginning of the journey, you know, bootstrapping it. Um, it was a long time ago, <laughs> uh, Marc-Andre, but, but how do you get started? You know, do you wait until a VC comes along and writes you a big check, or do you get started anyway? And, and what does that look like? And, and, you know, I guess we're thinking about the quintessential, um, you know, uh, social entrepreneur in the garage, or uh, maybe it's a, an organization that is thinking about, you know, branching out on a, in a new direction, um, but maybe doesn't have the resources yet. <laughs> yeah, so... Okay, it kind of goes back to the uh, last question about like how do you validate that the idea you have is uh, a good one, and you don't need to like you can do a lot of like fake it till you make it type of approach in the in the very beginning to to get validation, and it doesn't need to be you know opaque and and you're lying to people. It's more about sometimes your product idea can be distilled down like in its first prototype to a form, for example, like it's a pitch deck and like a couple of mock-ups and you're going to see your potential clients and they're going to tell you, you know, yes, it works. It, it solves a need or no, it doesn't. You need to refine this X way and, and whatnot. And you're going to quickly iterate. And it, that's not very costly, right? Like you can probably do it by yourself, you know, whatever background you have, whether it's financial or product or engineering and, and whatnot. So, um, so, so you, People, I think, often want to build everything first and then go to market and, and, and showcase how great their solution in, is. But there's lots of validation that you can accomplish with a mock-up of, of your idea and then LOIs afterwards if, uh, if people are interested. Then you do your homeworks in terms of like what the market is and your you know, base hypothesis of your go-to-market and marketing strategy and you know, financial projections, and then you're kind of ready to engage with VCs and investors and, and, and have some feedback. Um, it's maybe a bit corny, but there, there's a saying that says, um, you know, if you want money, ask for advice. And if you want advice, ask for money. Uh, that's often what happens. So like engaging with investors early on is, is a good way to, to build relationships. Like often, you know, whether it was with, with you guys or, or with, uh, Telus and Fond Action, like we've had months of prior engagements, uh, and just, you know, exchanging emails and having phone calls and updates and all that to, um, to, to start building that relationship in which, okay, at some point they're going to see that you're hitting your, your milestones or, or how, how you're resolving your issues and challenges. And then, and then, you know, that's how a good relationship is built. Like we're currently doing it with another investors in preparation for a series A, right? So, um, so, so I would say that's kind of the typical cycle. If you're, I don't know, like if you're doing generative AI at the moment and you've built six companies with great exits, you can probably go to investors uh, right away and say like, I've got this idea, fund me, and they'll write you a $20 million check. Um, but if it's not the case, then I would say, again, kind of go back to the basics of like, what is it to run a business? Like you're providing a product or a service and people are ready, are ready to pay for it or not. And if you've got this aligned, then, then you can seek investment to scale that up. Perfect, thanks. Um, MJ, I'm gonna throw a couple of questions your way. Um, folks are, are asking questions about, you know, how does it all work? Um, and one, one example of that is a question about how is the check size determined? Um, so is that, what's that driven by? Um, how does the investor think about check sizes and, uh, and come to a conclusion about how big a check they're gonna write? Um, is that about what's going on in the SPO investee side? Is that about what's going on in the fund side? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, thanks, Owen. So um, I would say, you know, funds have a have their investment strategy. You know, total. You know, as we talked about, for example, uh, at Bloom, we're gonna we are our hope is to be a mix of debt and equity. So we'll have, you know, say say a, say a ten million dollar fund, not twenty million dollar fund, ten million ten million each. Uh, debt sizes could be, uh, you know, could be. Smaller, more transactions because that is usually a bit easier uh, on, on the evaluation side, and uh, so so that'll that'll determine like internal investment strategy. I think is what it'll determine on the equity side. A lot of funds, including uh, what we are hoping at Bloom, is you know having an initial investment, then enough, and and most folks keep capital for some follow-on funding. Uh, so lesser transactions. So I, I would say you know the best way to do that is you know, just ask the uh, you know when you're having those conversations. Um, early stage, I would say, uh, early stage ventures would be 
you know, it could be anything initial, like capital of fifty to hundred thousand dollar, in like a very early stage pre pre demonstration. Um, I mean, I'm a big champion of like some demonstration already, but you know, I understand sometimes you need capital for that as well. And then I think once there is traction, uh, what I have seen average ticket sizes as around something to two between two hundred to three hundred. Uh, 300k it could be you know single transaction it could be one plus follow-on so so yeah uh, to conclude best way to do is just ask both on the tranches total tag ticket size uh, range as i said could or pre-validation 50 to 100 after that 200 to 300 um, and yeah it will be dependent on basically debt less more transaction smaller ticket sizes likely equity more follow-ons uh, yeah Got it. So based on what you're saying, one thing that a, a venture or an SPO can do to figure out where the match or fit might be is look at you know what check sizes are funds writing, what stage are they investing at, um, and 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 you know your 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 pre qualifying potential uh, investors in your venture by the stage and and by the the amount of capital that you're ready to uh, yep. ready to absorb. So that's that's super helpful. Um, we have a, you know, the $750 million question here from Joanne. Um, so Joanne has asked, do you all believe um, that putting together a diverse cap table, equity, grants, patient capital will become more common, easier to do in the future? Is this one of the goals of the social finance fund? And the question is being asked sort of specifically with respect to social purpose organization and, and impact ventures. Is is you know, so do you believe that that's going to, to become more common, easier to do in the future? Do you think the social finance fund is going to help? Uh, who do you want to go first? Uh, why don't you go first? You're off mute and then others can jump in. Okay, that's awesome. Um, so I think specific to SPO is, uh, yeah, uh, you know, I wrote a quick note there, both for fund side, because I'm thinking both for like, you know, Bloom raising its own capital as well as deploying capital, uh, I, I would say yes. Uh, Mark Andre, I think, um, you know, early stage uh, in investing, you know, you're not going to likely get the financial sustainability, and uh, you know, it, it could be. I mean, Uber is as as Lyft has broken even, Airbnb is there, Uber has taken billions of dollars sometimes. So you know, but sometimes social purpose businesses, in my view, uh, both on the equity and the debt side, face a bit more challenge of perception of profitability eventually, and you know lesser capital coming together. So I think what Mark Andre talked about that's been a great model, and Mark Andre shared some of those that you know you've raised investor capital, but you've also strongly and heavily leveraged you know uh, research capital, innovation capital, grants that that are that are there. Because the thing is, uh, on the debt side for a social purpose organization, it 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 is. Uh, you know, it's 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 going to be less burdensome, and on equity, you are diluting less, both for future investors, but also for uh, you know for the for the team uh, that is that is there. So yeah, I would I would say yes, uh, more more of that is happening. I think it's important to keep that in mind, uh, leveraging all forms of capital, especially in early stages. It could be tech grants like what we chatted. If if, if you are you know affordable housing building, you want some, you know. Pre-construction financing, legal work, chat with the local, you know, community futures, or maybe on actually community foundation that might have an interest in affordable housing, and a lot more of that is I've seen that happen. So I'll I'll uh, I'll stop there, and I'll, I'll maybe I actually add a comment there too on the fund side too. Some of the uh, you know stories in Canada on you know racially and gender diverse funds that have come up and become big success stories have started small and have leveraged grants like you know the Ravens of the world and others that have you know leveraged grants to bring build their financial sustainability so i think that's totally fair uh, when you go out i feel it's important to just be open honest and vocal about how you get to that financial sustainability and you know uh, if someone resonates great doesn't resonate that's fair game uh, yeah that's my that's my last one in there and so mark andre does that resonate with you what we've heard from joanne about putting together a diverse cap table a mix of equity grants patient capital um, does that sound like the right kind of mix? And and you know, <laughs> do you get a sense that, that that that's getting easier? You might have to hold your breath for a little while. Markets are are pretty tough right now, um, but with with an injection of you know 400 million uh, announced on May 29th to be matched two to one by private capital, that's 1.2 billion uh, coming into the social finance market in Canada. Uh, does it sound like the right mix? Um, is it possible to be optimistic in the, the tough fundraising environment out, out there? Does this word of the 
1.2 billion dollar injection and you know uh you know make you hope, hopeful for for that becoming a uh more viable for more ventures and spos in the future um compared to status quo or a few weeks ago yes it's making me more hopeful uh, of course, like having the news that there's, you know, $1.2 billion of net new capital within the, the market is, is going to help to some degree. Uh, afterwards, like you definitely want to try to diverse your sources of funding, like, and the number one that you want to look at, if possible, is revenue, right? That's always kind of something that it's easy to forget, um, whether when you're scaling up or, you know, based on the last few years, maybe pre-2022, where a lot of... Um, capital outside of revenue was available, you know, it, it's, you're still running a business. So it's important for, uh, for you to be able to try to generate revenue as much as you can. That's, that's what should be funding you at the very core. Uh, afterwards, um, it's, it, it really depends what your business is, but if you're able to leverage your, I mean, you should try to leverage as much as you can, the investor money that you're receiving to minimize either. Like, I mean, it's a mix of minimizing the, uh, dilution you're going to you're going to be submitted to or and or maximize or consolidate your capacity to execute on your milestones that you've promised investors um afterwards like specific grants that you can get access to like in our case we're at an interesting uh intersection of ai and agriculture like precision agriculture and biodiversity where we're able to benefit from some of the grant financing in these areas um so like on a business to business case it, it really depends but if, if you can, you should. Thanks. Um, I'll ask you a follow-up question and, and maybe MJ or Katie can weigh on, in on this as well. Um, there's a, a question in the chat um, about the level of uh, financial sophistication and literacy required on the part of founders. You, you know, a founder is trying to master a lot or an SBO is trying to master a lot, particularly when they're early in their investment readiness journey. How much expertise do they have to have before deciding to go out and tackle a problem? Or at what point in their journey does it, it start to kick in or, or, or how do you compensate for it if you, or, or, or build capacity if, if, uh, if you don't have it starting out? But the initial question is how important is that? Sorry, I had a glitch. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, no problem. I will do that and I'll invite um, MJ or Katie just to give an investor perspective and then I'll recap the question. Okay. Katie, okay, do you wanna go first or? Uh, go for it, MJ. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, 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 would, I would say, I, I don't know if this is going to be the you know politically correct answer, but I, I think I think you know an understanding of some of those basic fundamentals of things is is, is very important. And I, I would say you know sometimes finance and investment some you know jar becomes too jargony and 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 cumbersome and inaccess inaccessible. And uh, some of you know I've managed money from like Catholic nuns to billionaires, and my theory is if I can't explain to them what I'm doing, then I need to go back to the drawing board. So to say that you know these things don't have to be super complicated, but uh, I, I would uh, I would say both as like you know uh, SPOs you know community organization trying to to raise cap debt capital or something like Nectar doing equity I, I think uh, understanding of the business financials is is very important uh, you can bring in this is my opinion of course uh, you can bring at a growth stage you know someone to be more responsible but what I've seen early stages it's been like the key person. Uh, you know, uh, my conversations at Nectar have been with Mark Andre, and the same goes in other other pieces that I've worked on. Uh, because investors want to, like, when I, you know, uh, I'll put it this way, you know, my opinion is, you know, ideas are dime a dozen. It's about execution. And execution, a big factor around that is financial sustainability, operation sustainability, business plan. Mark Andre and you both talked about, you know, uh, solve in love, fall in love with the problem, not with the solution. I love that. And there's another one, you know, that I have valued is, uh, you know, be very passionate about the problems you solve and be very dispassionate on your execution. And that gives mm -hmm. a lot of comfort to the investor that, you know, you're a very like hands on wheel stable. You're passionate about what you do, but you understand the nuts and bolts uh, because once the money is out, like once you've signed the paperwork, that's why it goes back to my team part that when, you know, you have committed, 
be it fund investing, be it venture investing. You may not do the next round and all that, but you have committed at that point. So having those, so yeah, I, I would say uh, things are conclude, things are not that difficult, but in any case, debt or equity, social purpose, all ventures, uh, you'll have to, you should uh, have uh, understanding. And at those stages, you know, you can take support from your local community, your advisors, your committee members, and uh, investors are going to evaluate that. I do that in all kinds of transactions I do. Uh, don't expect everyone to know everything. But, yeah. uh, you know, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, one quick example is Sketch. It's a community born in Toronto that raised capital. There are just many, many other examples. And folks have, you know, uh, not from investment finance background, have kind of figured those pieces out. And that's given them comfort and the investors. So I'll, I'll stop there. Um, Mark Andre, in the interest of time, I'm going to give you a multiple choice version of that question. Do you think it is most important that a founder is A, passionate about addressing the problem, B, passionate about their solution, or C, passionate about not getting diluted? Oh, definitely A. Cool. Uh, okay, there, the award for uh, worst pun goes to Mark Andre. The award for the toughest question goes to Phil Sand. Um, and Phil Sand has uh, talked about the approach to engaging beekeepers, farmers, and indigenous-led organizations, conservation groups. Um, you know, what did that that look like, and what were the learnings from that? And it took many different forms. Um, there were circles led by indigenous organizations. There were, uh, you know, large design sessions, including many stakeholders, where we started with. Um, you know, an impact compass exercise, starting with the, you know, the high level SDGs that folks were keen to get at. So it took many forms. The number one takeaway, which was a surprising one, is that in the process, it was necessary to educate communities about social finance, what it was, how it worked, how it could be used. And ultimately, that's led to these communities generating original, new, creative, surprising ways of using social finance. So we've seen a ton of SPOs in the communities that have been exposed to this engagement exercise coming back, you know, nine months, 18 months later and saying, you know what, there's another problem out there we've been trying to solve for a long time and haven't been having the success we need to. And we think a social finance tool might be helpful. And that wasn't part of the plan, but it has been an, ex uh, an unexpected and, and a pretty exciting benefit. I'm very stoked about that. It's a great Great question. I'll drop a link to the Catalyst Community Finance Initiative into the chat. Catalyst is a great organization working with community finance organizations. There's a lot of resources and supports available at Catalyst, um, including around the kind of question that Phil Sen has asked about how do you do that engagement and, and how do you do it well? And so with that, I will hand it back to um, the hosts. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Owen, for that. Fantastic moderation. Uh, thank you as well to uh, Mark Andre, Katie, and MJ for that informative and engaging discussions, and also for actively engaging with our participants uh, throughout the session. We really, really appreciate that. Uh, there were a ton of great takeaways and considerations, and we, and of course, we appreciate all your time and effort, uh, passion, and enthusiasm uh, as well uh, for this field. Uh, I would like to now uh, request our CEO, uh, Andrea Nemtan, to join us uh, briefly to provide some closing remarks. Thanks, Andrea. Hi, everyone. Thank you. And uh, I just want to say very quickly, thank you to everyone who was on this panel and all of the panels and case studies that we've um, we've done through this program. Muska and the team, Kathleen, Alex, and others have done this amazing, incredible amount of work over, uh, I think it's been just, just under a year to be able to bring a number of different examples of folks who've actually become investment ready, um, who, who've taken the long journey to achieving uh, investment into their ventures. We really were hoping to be able to share a nuanced perspective of the social enterprises challenges, the investors and the funds in each of these webinars. So I just want to just thank everyone who um, has come and, and it takes a lot of time to prepare for these. And so really honor uh, the, the enterprises and the folks that have been able to contribute to the learning and all of you who have actually shown up. I think this is, uh, we've done a number of these. I think it's nine or 10. Muska will tell me the exact amount on everything from sketch to IndieGraph to 
um, Nectar today, we did something on um, entrepreneurs, um, on the, the, the social capital partners, presented the employee ownership frameworks. And, and none of these would have been worth doing unless people had actually came and participated and listened and, and chatted in the chat and brought yourselves and your energy. So a huge thank you to Muska and to all of you. And uh, I will hand it back to you, Muska. And I just want to say gratitude. Miigwech. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea, as well, for, for your leadership and for helping spearhead this important uh, program uh, in partnership with DSDC.